Today's reading comes from Genesis chapter 25, starting with verse 24. When she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered she had twins. The first came out, red all over, and clothed with hair. She named him Esau. Immediately afterwards, his brother came out, gripping Esau's heel, and she named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the young men grew up, Esau became an outdoorsman who knew how to hunt, and Jacob became a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished, and he said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was also called Edom, which means red. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. For the conclusion of our Soul Cafe series, we invite you to the Cotton Kitchen. Uh, this is the place of special times and special events. Uh, fortunately for those who know and love us, Tina is the chef. I like to call this the Cocina de Tina. Uh. <laughs> and uh, this is the place where she puts together soul food. And uh, our scripture lesson today is about the creation of a stew for hmm. Isaac. So uh, that was his soul food. And I've had to learn about stew here. <laughs> Yes, you have. You know, we, uh, I grew up with soup and, and chowder, but not stew. So, Tina, what kind of stew are we going to have today? We're going to make a beef stew with root vegetables. All right. And uh, what's going to be in this? Well, we have some chuck roast that I've diced and some um, vegetables. I have onion, carrots, and parsnips with a little bit of garlic. Okay, and so then you're preparing this, how so? Okay, so you brown the meat first with a little oil, and with the meat you're going to add some flour and some seasonings, and, and then just brown that up really good in the pot uh, with some oil, um, cook it for just a little bit, add some beef broth, or I actually like to use stock, and cook that up for a little while. Add your vegetables after that, cook for a little while longer. It's smelling good now. <laughs> mm, I can't wait. I'm, I'm looking for that. And this is something that not only I'm going to enjoy because this is, I've learned to love your stew. Oh, and good. then uh, this is something that I, I'd love to share with some other folks as well. You really? always make enough for a lot of folks. Well, so yeah, you know. uh, I think I'd like to take this to the, to the church where the staff and, and others could enjoy it. Huh. Okay. So, uh, anyhow, I look forward hmm. to, to eating this. All right. Uh, wait. Isn't what today the 28th? What well, is You have the, somewhere to be, right? The 28th. <gasps> the opening! Yes. Oh, no! Uh, I'm, I'm not even dressed. I, I, I've got to I've go and You better get, get going. You better, right. Oh, wait, wait. Don't forget to take the stew. All, all right. Uh, we'll set it here, and then uh, I will go change. All right. <sighs> Well, this is a little awkward. Um, Will's not here yet. Um, I'm sure he is on his way. Maybe he took a little nap from the stew that he had, but he should be here any minute. In, in seminary, they always said you maybe have to have a, a sermon in your back pocket. Um, I don't, so you may hear again about sourdough bread or something today, but I'm sure Will is around, going to be around. I'll see if he's texted me or anything, but I'm sure he will be here any moment. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I thought, uh, you know, regathering, this isn't the way to really begin it. Uh, I hope it didn't put you in too much of a stew. 
I need to get a seat here and kind of catch my breath. It's so good to see you in person. You know, uh, thank you for uh, following us online, but, but here we are. And it just, it does my heart good. I hope it does yours to, to see each other and make this beginning as we regather. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for this chance to gather both in person and online. And I just ask that the fullness of your spirit would, would be upon us all. And we just give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ. Amen. Uh, so this is a story about Stu. It's also the story of twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. But in Sunday school, I didn't learn about Esau and Jacob. I learned about Jacob and Esau. How about you? And in fact, in my study Bible, it says Jacob and Esau. But the real order is Esau and Jacob. Esau was the one that was first born. And names are important in the Bible, particularly in the book of Genesis. And so Esau literally means hairy one. Now, before I came to Round Rock, I didn't pay much attention to that until I learned about Hairy Man Road. You all know where Hairy Man Road is in Round Rock? Maybe you've been lost on that thing. And, and so there's a wonderful legend that goes with Harry Man Road, how that there was a family that was coming through as pioneers in the 1800s, and their boy got lost from his family, and they weren't able to get reunited, and so he grew up as a hermit in the Cat Hollow area. And as he, uh, and, and ever since then, he tends to make appearances in Cat Hollow to people ever since then. And in, since 1994, we have, uh, there, there is a, a celebration where we have hairy men contests. Well, I think I know Esau would win the hairy man contest uh, from the way our scripture reads. So Esau is the first to be born, and then in comes the second of the twins, and he's holding on to the heel of Esau, and so they call him Jacob, which means grabber or trickster. And he spends the rest of his life living up to that name. But we're not going to talk much about Jacob today. We want to talk about Esau, and particularly about that last verse of Scripture in our Scripture lesson that says he despised his birthright. That was no small thing to do. I mean, uh, a birthright entitled you to much in those days. Uh, first of all, you were the executor of the family estate. And I'm going to tell you that that family, Isaac and Rebekah, they were the daughter and son-in-law of Abraham and Sarah, and they were filthy rich. And so when you would have the executor of the state, he also got two-thirds of the family fortune. And so being firstborn had a lot of benefits from it. And then the other twin, and they were miraculous twins, they were an answer to prayer, then the second one born would only get half as much. They would get the one-third of the estate and, they, and wouldn't have the power that, that Esau had as the firstborn. So you can see what kind of setup that would be for rivalry, and surely there was. So we have the story where Esau, who is a hunter, he, he's a, a man's man, he's, he's, he's his dad's son, and let's just say Isaac was also not the brightest one in the fold, and so Esau seems to kind of track with his dad there too. And, and so Esau comes in from his hunting, and he is famished, doesn't know, uh, is, is not thinking well, and he sees Brother Jacob with some lentil stew. And he thinks, I ought to have some of that. And Jacob, because he 
kind of sees that Esau is an easy mark, actually puts some red in the stew to, to make it a, a, a little better. And the language is that uh, Esau says, I, I'd like to have that stew. And Jacob says back, well, it's going to cost you. And he says, well, whatever it costs, Jacob says, well, it's going to cost you your birthright. That benefit you have as the firstborn child. Well, he's like a teenager. You know how hungry teenagers get. And he says, well, I'm starving to death. What do I care about a birthright? So yeah, I'll, I'll give you my birthright. And so he gives away, he trades away his birthright, his status in life, his wealth and his future for a bowl of stew. He trades away what is the best for something less. Now, what we find out is that uh, he's not the only one in the Bible that does this. See, what Esau has done is he has sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D. And, and we've seen that earlier. Uh, consider the story of Lot. Remember Lot and his wife? And, and so uh, Lot decides that he is going to set up residence where there's lots of action and lots of wealth, and, and, and that would be Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he then trades away that and who he is so he can be there, and the results are awful. Or we can think of Samson. Samson, who had a Nazarite vow, his life was sold out to God for a special purpose, and that meant he had great strength and great attraction, but he starts to worship that great strength and that attraction. And so he becomes sold out. And it's disastrous. Or think of King Solomon, all that wisdom, and being at the height of Israel itself. And he falls in love with way too many of the ladies, and he falls in love with his own power. And so at the end of his reign, he ends up having his kingdom split between his two sons. That's just three examples of people who, who sold out with disastrous results. They're actually part of dozens of them in the Bible. There, there seems to be this pattern in the Bible, but also in our own lives, where what we do is we trade what is best for something less in a given moment. So why did Esau do that? And, and why would we do that? And I think there's a simple answer. We tend to be appetite-driven. And, and so we have this example now of Esau, who is appetite-driven. And, and the first appetite that seems to drive him is, is convenience. Uh, we all are, are driven by convenience. Uh, we like things to happen instantly, and when we uh, desire to have them. Uh, so this past Christmas, our kids got us two different uh, gifts. One was an air fryer. So both of them were for our kitchen. And the second one was an Instapot. I'm going to tell you, we've really fallen in love with that Instapot. So when we were having the stew made for today's sermon, and, and I've been enjoying it through the week, if I'm honest, uh, the, the, uh, we had a choice to make. Would we slow cook that chuck roast, or would we throw it in the Instapot? Uh, what do you think Tina did? We're no dummies. We threw it in the Instapot, and it, and it worked great. We love convenience. Yeah, it was convenient for uh, Esau then to just grab what his brother had made. I mean, yes, he was starving to death, but he could have waited for Rebecca to make him some new stew, or he could have made it himself, but he wasn't going to do that. And so in order for Esau to really become the man that he would need to become in his life, he was going to have to be governed by something more than convenience. The, the same is true for us. 
in our walk with Jesus. We love to have those great emotional experiences that happen for us in a given moment. And in fact, sometimes we just want to stack up those immediate kinds of experiences. But you're a United Methodist. And one of the things we know about salvation as United Methodists is it's not just an event, not just something, an emotional experience we have at a given time, but that becomes the first step in a process, and that process is where we are gradually uh, made perfect in love. And, and it's, it's a slow cook process. It, it, it's kind of back and forth, and, and, and it's uneven, and it's inconvenient. So during our time in COVID-19 as First United Methodist Church, one of the things we've had is just lots of creativity. Haven't you enjoyed the creativity that has come online and it's been with your Zoom meetings and it's been with your uh, things that are on Facebook Live and, and on Twitter and Instagram and all these things. We have learned a lot. At the same time, it's also been a time for convenience. Uh, you know, I've had several of you actually say to me, it's going to take a lot to get me back in there alive because I've been enjoying worship in my PJs and with my coffee. You know, there's this, uh, and, and, and we've enjoyed being able to get whatever we've needed when we wanted it. But following Jesus is not convenience-driven. It's inconvenient to get dressed and drive and go to a study where you grow with people around you, especially ones that might not see things like you see them. It's inconvenient to reach out and mission and rub elbows with people who are going through a tough time. And so following Jesus is not convenient. But if we're not careful... We will choose that which is convenient and trade that which is best for something less. Uh, th there, was an, there was another thing that, that, that drove Esau and tends to drive us, and that is our self-gratification. Uh, we're used to getting what we want. Like I said, Esau was a, a young man of means. He was used to getting what he wants. You can see that in the language and the story. I mean, we're used to pushing a button, and it happens. We're used to going to a store, and if they don't have it, we'll go to another store that does. And, and so we're used to the choices that come with being people of means. We're used to getting what we want. And that was a perfect setup for him and his twin brother, the grabber. Walter Russell Bowie says it this way, What was the matter with Esau? He was a man who lived only in the immediate moment. He was heir to the birthright, and the birthright meant a great deal. If you looked far enough, Esau had showed that he did not care enough for life's great possibilities to pay the price of present discipline. He must have had what he wanted when he wanted it, and consequences could go hang he lost tomorrow because he snatched so greedily at today. Sometimes we pay a big price for getting what we want, for that short-term gain or, or maybe that new promotion at work or, or maybe getting elected to an office. In a, in a town where I was serving in ministry, there, one of the things that the Methodist men liked to do was to inter, have the inter, candidates come and just share their, their shtick uh, with, uh, with the Methodist men. So we had two people running for the House of Representatives, and these were uh, for, uh, for Congress. And so uh, it had been known in the Texas Monthly, they had written up about their campaign that it was the dirtiest in the whole state of Texas. So they came and they talked to our Methodist men, and each one claimed to be uh, church leaders. So I asked one of them at the end, okay, you've just been written up in Texas Monthly as having the dirtiest campaign in the state of Texas, and yet I'm hearing that you are an elder in your church. How are you holding that all together? And the person said, just 
easily back to me. That's what you have to do to get elected. That's how you can serve the people. I, I said back to him, I asked, uh, is that how you're going to stay serving people? He didn't have an answer to that question. Now, we could easily throw stones of judgment here at uh, the hypocrisy of, of, of that moment. But the truth is, we can justify anything when it's about getting what we want. You know, we are not meant to have, to be people who follow the way of self-gratification. We're the people who follow the way of the cross, the way of self-denial. But how tempted we are to trade away that which is best for that which is less. Uh, there is another uh, thing that tends to, to drive us, and, and that is our, our need for tr approval, that appetite. How I love to please. A and how I sweat it when I don't. Is that you? I bet many of you it is. You know, when we were junior high kids and senior high kids, oh, we'd done anything to fit in. We'd have stood on our heads. We would have said anything. We might have used profane language. We, we might have done all kinds of things to fit in. That was peer pressure. Of course, we, we all grew out of peer pressure, right? Not so much. What we do is later we're, we're at work and in order to fit in, and so when somebody tears down somebody else at work or they make them the, the butt of, of, of bad humor and, and, and decisions are made that hurt people, and we stay silent because we don't want to rock the boat or mess up the relationships we have. Uh, the same is true sometimes we just violate our own sense of integrity and we just dummy up. We don't speak from our soul and we find a way of losing that soul. I think that's what Paul had in mind when he said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. You and I every day are invited to be fashioned in the world's ways according to its ethics according to what seems expedient and will help you in the moment. All of advertising is, is shaping you that way. You have pressures at work that are shaping you that way. You have ways that your kids and your grandkids that are being shaped that way. It's the pressure to conform. It's also the pressure to deny ourselves and to get sold out. It's that Choosing to trade away that which is best for that which is less. So let me bring this home a little bit. You see, because you have a birthright. It says in, first, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that you were created in God's image. You have God's stamp. You have the divine spark in you, and no one can take that away from you. Amen? According to the uh, 139th Psalm, verse 14, from conception itself, it says that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And so when you get up in the morning and you have that bed head and you figure that you ought to be shattering the mirror you're looking into, uh, when you... Uh, are unable to land that account that you wanted to land so badly and you feel like you have failed, remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and no one can take that from you. Amen? It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. According to God's word, you are royalty. You are children of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and no one can take that from you. It's your birthright. So no one can take it from you, but you can trade it away. And to avoid that, you, you have to make a key decision, and it's a daily decision, a moment moment-by-moment -moment decision, and that is you can no longer choose to be appetite-driven, but instead to be spirit-led. 
where you intentionally tune in to God's way about you. The Bible says that we pray in the Spirit, and so we, we, we offer our prayers to God, and then we, we listen for God to speak into our hearts, and we tune into our a native GPS. We pray in the Spirit, and so our partnership with God is firmed up every day, and it requires that kind of attention. And the Bible says that we walk in the Spirit. That's where we practice. We put into motion uh, what we believe about God and the things that are the most important. What we find is often we are under practice. Uh, we may be okay prayed, and we may be okay thinking, but we're under practiced. When our youngest son was a, a teenager and had gotten his license, then we handed down to him our, our vintage uh, Dewu Laganza. We bought that thing in 2001. We called it the Jagget. Uh, and so it was a jag, because I, I thought it looked like a jaguar. It just was kind of cut off on the end, and, and we bought it for $16,000, so that, that seemed like a good price. Uh, so we bought that Daewoo, and then, lo and behold, a month after we bought it, that company went belly up. But it was a great car. It was sleek, wonderful. And so Tina had driven it, and Tyler had driven it, and now it was Reese's time to drive it. And it had 60,000 miles of an unlimited warranty on it, and at 61,000 miles, the engine blew up. Murphy's Law, right? And so then we had an issue because for the cotton, 61,000 is just warming up. Okay, and so I, I called our, our garage that we had work on our cars and I said, do you think there's some junkyard somewhere that might have an engine that we could put in this Daewoo? So they went on a research project and he, he calls me back and he says, you're a preacher, aren't you? You must be living right. Because I'm going to tell you that in Dallas, we have an engine for a Daewoo Luganza that is in the box, never used. And it's 2500 bucks. I said, sign me up. And so they put that new engine in that old Luganza. And yes, we, to be legal, we couldn't change the mileage. So it could still had to say 61000 But the truth is, the engine had zero on it. And it ran like the top for many, many years following because it had the right engine in it. What happens when we're appetite-driven is that we end up running on the wrong engine and it will fail us. It's not worthy of us. You were not designed to be appetite-driven. You were designed to be spirit-led. And so today... I invite you to make a different kind of trade-in where you trade in that which is less but that which is the very best. A daily, moment by moment, in tune, walk with God. So as you look at your own heart right now, as you look at this last week, were you more appetite-driven or were you more spirit-led? And how will you be from this moment on? And the good news is this. This is not up to our best efforts. This is where we lean on the grace of God and we are led into life like we never dreamed it would be. That's the promise. That's the gift of God. That's the gift we share with the world around us. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you that we don't have to be driven, that we can be led by you. So Lord, we are making the trade. We can't in our own strength, and so we ask by your Spirit, help us to make that trade life abundant, life resilient, life joyous, and life hopeful is what we live. 
and what we share. In the name of Christ, amen.